This is Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson podcast. We are rolling. Welcome back, everyone, to Cosmographia Podcast with Randall Carlson, Brothers of the Serpent, Brad, and Mike. Mike is back. Mike. How you doing, buddy? All right. I'm, I'm recovering. Thank you. I was out for a couple of weeks because of illness. I would, or, or you could say I was hiking in Patagonia. I don't care. <laughs> Mike was we hiking prefer in that, that you were hiking in Patagonia, and we uh, want you to, you know, go into a little bit of detail here this <laughs> evening on uh, what you encountered. Yeah, I mean, my understanding was you were down there looking for the uh, Patagonian uh, incarnation of Bigfoot. Uh, yeah, Patagonian Pete. I... <laughs> <laughs> Normal guy goes way out there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Which brings up a question I've wondered, are there Bigfoot sightings in South America? I've never heard of any. No. Not no. necessarily that I believe in Bigfoot. I don't know what to think about Bigfoot. We'll have to talk about that sometime. But yeah. we know there are sightings around. But are there reported sightings in South America of Bigfoot? I, I don't know. That's a good know. question. I've never heard of them. No, there are cryptid I'm, sightings down there, but they're not. I don't think any of Bigfoot. But there Not are. a Bigfoot. Yeah, yeah it's more are. chupacabra type stuff down there, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And there's the skunk ape. Uh, but that might be well. I think that's that's Florida. Yeah, that might be Skunk Florida. Skunk ape. Yeah. Yeah, I think once upon a time, I one of my the skunk ape might have been one of my employees. <laughs> that I. But it's like South America has that jungle. It's like everything's encrypted in there. They're constantly finding new species. Anyway, no one would be well, surprised if they found a Bigfoot in there, right? If they found <laughs> a skinless one, though, or yeah. a hairless one. I mean, hairless Bigfoot. Yeah. Man, I don't want to think about that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the hairless version of the of Sasquatch. <laughs> yeah, I think I've known somebody like, like that a, too. Like tiny, all shriveled up. Oh yeah, yeah, mini squash. Yeah. So yeah. we've been talking yeah. about uh, the younger Dryas events. Yep. That's what we were talking about. I remember now. It's all coming back to me. <laughs> So, yeah, interesting times. And I would uh, think that getting more knowledge out there, more people looking at this, this period of time is going to be valuable. We need a lot of perspectives on this because it's still not explained yet. There's, there's too many unexplained variables. Bolide impact seems almost certain, but were there other factors? Could there have been a solar factor? I think that's very plausible, and we should certainly explore that as a possibility, because I don't rule out um, Robert Schock's ideas. Um, I don't necessarily think it's an either or, actually. I think it's perhaps we're looking at a series of episodes stretching over that 14.6 to 11.6 thousand years ago, centered around 12.9, but it could have been a multiplicity, a very complex series of events that peaked at 12,009, because 12,009 is when we find the impact proxies. But at 14.6, this is the dating for Meltwater Pulse 1A. Now, if that dating is correct, if, if it's correct, then that means that there was something that happened that injected enough energy into the system to melt copious amounts of, of uh, glacier, uh, uh, ice sheet, um, that's then returned into the ocean basins and causes this first big pulse of sea level rise. What caused that? Was that impact, an earlier impact? Were the traces of such impact have been lost or just haven't been found? Or was it something solar or something we haven't even begun to imagine yet? But the point is, is that at 14.6, at 12.9 and 11.6, we seem to have energetic, highly energetic events. At 12.9, we have impact proxies. To my knowledge, we do not have impact proxies at 11.6 or 14.6. That 
So, but something that nevertheless had to have happened because you don't just suddenly melt, you know, a few hundred thousand cubic miles of ice over a very short period of time without some source of energy that's going to trigger that melting. And that is the question. What was the source of that energy? However, at 12.9, we do have this growing body of evidence that suggests the ET component in the form of the proxies we've been talking about, the nanodiamonds, the magnetic grains, the microspherals, the platinum and iridium deposits that are being found in ice, the, the soot, um, the carbonized layers that suggest uh, extraordinary bio, uh, biomass burning. So how do you explain biomass burning? Well, could, could it be the sun? I don't know. I don't know if this, you know, again, there's so much new information coming out every year on so much of this stuff, particularly like solar physics and, and the role of the sun. It's hard to keep up with it all. But there certainly is growing evidence that the sun is a highly variable star, a lot more variable than anybody had assumed, you know, back 25 or 30 or 40 years ago. In fact, most of the 20th century was the solar constant, the solar constant. But the question is, is that can small variations in radiative output of the sun be somehow amplified through some kind of positive feedbacks? And that's one of the major questions under discussion right now. But um, we certainly do know that there's debris out there. We know there's comets. We know there's asteroids. We know that we've had close encounters repeatedly. We've had close encounters just within the last few years, right? So this is nothing too exotic to invoke the idea that there are actual impacts into the Earth on a fairly regular basis. Now, one would assume from the, the scale and magnitude of these, what we've seen recently is that these uh, objects are not going to be enough to claw that we've seen recently would not be enough to cause a global catastrophe. Global catastrophe, we're probably looking at at least a half a mile in diameter, probably more like a mile above. A mile would be disastrous, perhaps on a continental scale. Would it be disastrous on a planetary scale? Well, it may not be um, disastrous to where it would essentially wipe out biological life like you would have in the epicenter of a, you know, basically wherever, if you had a, a, a kilometer or a mile sized asteroid or, or piece of a comet nucleus striking the ground, right? Say it's a mile in, in diameter. Well, that's going to pretty much sterilize everything probably for somewhere around a radius of 500 miles. And then beyond that, you know, the, 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 uh, magnitude of the destruction would begin to fall off. If you're on the opposite side of the earth, you could probably survive. Unless, of course, you had a seismic wave that traveled around the planet and then converged at the antipode of the impact. Now, that's a possibility that has actually been proposed uh, relative to the Cretaceous tertiary impact because the, uh, the impact site in the Yucatan would have been directly opposite the point that looks very close to the outflow of the deck and traps in India. Mm. The Deccan Traps was one of, of course, the great volcanic events in the history of the earth that is oftentimes blamed for the uh, extinction of the dinosaurs. And there's, that's been one of the ongoing controversies uh, between uh, regarding to the KT extinctions, which by the way is not KT anymore. Now it's KP, the Cretaceous Paleogene, you know, and it's I'm I'm having tough time with that because for 30 years I think KT 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 now all of a sudden they want me to change to KP the Cretaceous Paleo see it's it's difficult enough because Cretaceous starts with a C but we're using the letter K right well that's because we're already using the letter C for the Cambrian so we couldn't use the letter C again or otherwise it would be very confusing so they use the letter K which probably in Latin Creta which means chalk probably started with a uh, with a K is what I'm going to guess. But in any case, the KT boundary is now the KP boundary. So anybody who is actually trying to do research, don't get confused. It's the same boundary. It, the KT is the KP. It's where the dinosaurs went extinct and where it's almost 100% verified now that there was a huge impact that left a giant buried crater 
flanking the Yucatan Peninsula, six, roughly 66 million years ago. But on the other side of the earth, you had the Deccan Traps. And the Deccan Traps were just belching out billions of uh, tons, metric tons of sulfate aerosols into the earth's atmosphere, which would have all kinds of drastic consequences. So my take on it is, that, again, it's not an either or thing. I mean, and I don't know, and nobody knows for sure because of the, the, the dating resolution is not fine enough to, to determine was the deck and traps volcanism, that episode, a consequence of the impact? May, so it has been proposed that that the shock wave of that impact might be enough to induce these massive plume volcanisms that we see. Because when we go back to the Permian Triassic of 241 million years ago, what do we find there? We find that there was the huge volcanic outflow that left the Siberian traps, which is, again, one of the gigantic um, magmatic events in the history of the earth. And of course, that correlates with the greatest mass extinction on earth, where 90 to 95% of all species in the oceans went extinct, and something like 80% of all land species bit the dust. That was, that was, it has been said, that was the closest that life came to being wiped out completely on the earth was that Permian Triassic. But then we fall, find the, um, the, uh, Triassic Jurassic mass extinction, which is one of the great five, being associated with the uh, central Atlantic magmatic plume, which was also a huge outflow. So, but also in each of those big five, there's evidence not as definitive and, and, and as conclusive as the evidence you find at the KT boundary, but there is evidence at every single boundary for impacts. So it seems to me that there may be a situation where you have impacts. So you have something from outside the earth associated with massive volcanism inside the earth, exogenic, endogenic, coupling together. And, and it's through the combined effects of the exogenic and the endogenic that you get these really, really massively catastrophic disruptions of the biosphere that leads to. Um, a, a, a very profound loss of species. And the great five, of course, that's what, what characterizes them. Each one of them is that you've got hugely proliferating species, you know, Ordovician, late over Ordovician, late Devonian, you've got all kinds of fish in the ocean, you've got things going on, and then boom, over half, over half of all species are gone in a very, very short period of time, geologically speaking. So those are the great five. And in, one, in, in some of the upcoming uh, episodes, we're going to get into some of those in detail because they're extremely important to understand, um, especially with the claims that we are now in the midst of a, an extinction crisis equivalent in severity and magnitude to the great five, which is the implication of calling it the great, the sixth great mass extinction. And, so that for that reason alone, but for multiple reasons, it will be worthwhile to look at those events. Then, once having looked at the Great Five, then we come back to the mass extinction at the end of the Pleistocene, you know, 11 or 12,000, 13,000 years ago. And of course, what we see in terms of species loss is that the mass extinction at the end of the Pleistocene um, doesn't even come close to the Great Five. But in its own way, it was profound and very severe because basically what happened was the food chain got decapitated almost. And in, in some of the comments um, that I've actually been enjoying reading, um, that's been the, one of the questions was, you know, regarding species that the, the modern species, and yes, most of the modern species did exist during the Pleistocene. Yeah. And the question really, I think, more just comes down to the randomness of the event, why some species survived and some didn't. And the fact that some species survived, and we made this point earlier, the, the, the fact that some species survived didn't mean that, this, that the species didn't come close to extinction. And we cited and talked about the example of the American bison. And here, here was a, uh, a species that, of, of mega mammal that was reduced to about 300 individuals. I mean, you can't get much closer to extinction than that. And yet within 
a little over a century, it's completely rebounded, right? And in retrospect, looking back from 10,000 years hence, you could look back and completely miss the fact that, that there was this huge bottleneck in the population of American bison. And so we might look back at, at moose, right? Or we, you know, any of the North American animals that still exist, um, musk oxen, for example, well known to have existed in the ice age during the late Pleistocene, but they survived somehow, right? It may have been the luck of the draw. And, and, and I don't think anyone can say specifically why one species survived and another one went extinct, other than the fact that, again, it's not a uniform event. It's going to play out differently depending on, you know, latitude, geography, climate, environment. All of these are going to be variables in this equation. Why some species succumb and why some survive? Open question at this point. But we do know that these events can certainly eliminate species. And we do see a preference for large species. And when you consider that large species require a, a, a greater, more extensive uh, food base, they, um, their, their intergenerational turnover time is much slower than smaller species. Um, yeah, gestation times much, much longer. Um, so when you, when you have habitat loss, it's going to affect the top of the food chain. You see, because if they, if, if you have a, have a, a, say a cosmic winter type event, which is basically what we're looking at with the younger dry. So you have this sudden cooling uh, that, that descends over the earth, you're going to have large scale vegetation die off, right? And so if you've got large species that need to eat, you know, hundreds of pounds of, of vegetation every day. And then the predators that rely on those. So I think you're going to have initially in the, uh, the event, and if we're talking about an impact event here, and as we get more into the details of this, I think that the model that, that we're beginning to see is that we're look, actually talking about a multiple impact event, right? You're going to have, first of all, large scale species mortality as a result of the impacts themselves. But then you're going to have a whole series of, of consequences that play out over years, if not centuries, because now you've got this unstable environment. And you're also going to have, you know, in the case of the, um, the Balling Alarod, Younger Dryas shift, you had a shift from relatively benign climate where the glaciers are contracting to a sudden, uh, a, a sudden return to full glacial cold. And that was why, you know, the younger Dryas got, got named after uh, Dryas octopetala, which is the polar wildflower that had already disappeared from Northern Europe because of the, of the uh, late glacial warming that was going on. And then it suddenly returns again, showing that you had this sudden return to glacial conditions. So, you know, my point being that, you know, if you've got animals that are depending on the habitat and depending on uh, abundant uh, plant life and vegetation, now suddenly you've got this um, impact winter, we'll call it, um, and perhaps this return to full glacial cold, you're going to have a massive vegetation die-off. Now, one of the things we'll be talking about further is the, the evidence for large-scale biomass burning. So, you know, in, in the, in, as we begin to decipher this series of events, we, you know, it's, it's not simple. It's a very complex series of things that happen. And so we know that at the end of this complex series, a lot of about half in North America, about half of the mega mammals didn't survive. About half of them did, right? I think what we were looking at is a threshold type event. And this is now a, 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 a legitimate uh, conceptual framework for looking at, at these episodes of change is that there are thresholds that can get breached and the, the breaching of these episodes depends on the amount of energy that's going to be injected into the system because the, every change that occurs requires energy inputs of some kind. So what we're coming, kind of coming down to is having to sort this out and look at basically 3,000 years of major global transition that led from the world as it was, say, 15,000 years ago to the world as it is now. And, you know, we're, we've talked about that. And 
we'll continue to talk about it, it to, to really begin to try to clarify these dramatic changes, these planetary scale changes. Because um, in one of the comments, um, somebody was posting that, we'll, we'll have to read it, we'll get into it. But, you know, I've said repeatedly that the that the great ice masses of North America, which were basically two distinct ice masses, the Laurentide, which was basically centered over Hudson Bay, reached down to as far as almost as north, almost to northern Ohio, almost almost to the Ohio River east of the Mississippi, reached into the Pacific Ocean, actually further than the coastline now exists because with the lowered sea level, coastline had shifted to the east. The ice sheet followed that, so you had. Um, you had ice sheets that were melting back as the ocean is rising. And so the ice sheets are melting back, revealing those shelves that were um, buried under the ice. And then the sea is advancing, drowning those shelves. The other interesting thing is, is that as the ice is removed, you know, it's made this huge depression over the Hudson Bay. And as it's removed, picture this. Here's, here's, say, the North American craton. Here's the glacier. Weight of the glacier is depressing the center, but around the perimeter, it's rising. That is called the glacial forebulge. So, boom, the glacial forebulge. Now you have the deglaciation, so the, it, the, it's relaxing, and then the glacial forebulge goes down. So that complicates trying to determine precisely where sea level was and when it was there. You see, so again, it, it, this is not a simple thing here. This is a, a very uh, complex matter to try to sort all this out, but it sure is fun. The Laurentide went to the Atlantic, right? It was the well, Laurentide went to the Atlantic, and then in the west, it reached to to the almost to the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. Right. Okay. And then over Western Canada, in Western North America, was the Cordilleran Ice Sheet. Right. And exactly. it reached from basically uh, northern, it, it came down where Glacier Park is now, was a, is a remnant of the Cordillera and Ice Sheet, right? And it came down into northern Idaho, the panhandle of Idaho, and northern Washington, and it reached up to Alaska. And for modern comparison, you can kind of think of the Laurentide as being roughly the size of Antarctica, the south polar ice cap, and the Cordillera being roughly the size of the ice sheet that's over Greenland. Wow. So you had these two massive ice sheets over North America, which pretty much at their maximum covered the whole northern half of North America under massive amounts of glacial ice. So, you know, it, that's the kind of thing that as you begin to think about it and contemplate it, um, you begin to realize, well, good Lord, really have to go through some serious changes to get rid of all of that ice um, and, you know, we're not even talking about, you had another Greenland-sized ice sheet that was over northwestern Europe. Right. That's right. Yeah. So and that's gone, too. So we're, did, did, like, our modern little beavers exist back then along with the gigantic ones, or are they? Oh, I, yeah, I, I think so, yeah. So, that, so what, what we're looking at now, that it, like, the little armadillos and little beater, beavers aren't, like, an adapted version. The little beaters? Yeah, yeah. they were there. T yeah, the little beaters were. <laughs> yeah, dang beaters. <laughs> the, 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 those little armadillers <laughs> yeah, and the little beaters. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I mean, yeah. They, I don't know specifically about the little armadillos. They, I think they did. I mean, a lot of the, yeah, I, I would say probably yes. I mean, if we're looking at the smaller animals, you see, a, a modern a armadillo is not going to be a mega mammal. Right. And yes, I, I think that they existed. I mean, in, in, the, in the deposits, um, well, for example, horses in North America went extinct, but they didn't go extinct in other places in the world. Right. And then horses were introduced into North America by the Spaniards. I, I think people were asking, some of the comments I saw, people were trying to ask, like, are the, what, some of the animals we see, like, just smaller versions of what was that back then or yeah. did they exist coexist with those giant versions? i think it was mostly coexists okay. but i think we did see smaller versions now an interesting uh case in point would be the american bison because during the late pleistocene you had the super bison which was huge right now is north american bison which is still huge if you've been up next to one you know that they're pretty formidable beasts and you probably wouldn't want one uh trampling you but 
The point is that they're, they're much smaller than the super bison. Now, is it a diminutive version of the super bison, perhaps? Or is it a completely different species? Yeah, that's the question. That's the question. Right. I, I'm, thinking, yeah. I'm thinking that what I've learned, and I could be, I could be wrong on this because I am occasionally wrong, but this uh, American bison is a smaller version. Okay. Well, we certainly do know, and we talked last week, we mentioned the pygmy mammoths. But of course, that's because of, the, because of the insular existence. You know, in other words, they've got limited range, li limited habitat range, like these, the pygmy mammoths that are found on, on the islands, right? So basically, they adapt by getting smaller. Less food. Mm -hmm. yeah. Less food. It would less, be interesting less, to see some yeah. uh, DNA studies on these various yeah and 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 see again i that's something that needs to be done and and it is being done and you know if i had more time i would certainly be diving into all of that because these are it raises very interesting questions about um about the whole process of evolution and extinction because essentially it, it appears to me that once we now begin to accept the idea of catastrophic mass extinctions followed by rapid speciation. It does really raise a whole host of interesting new questions about the evolutionary process. Right, that it happens very quickly and then slows down once all the ecological niches are filled and then it becomes yeah. more stable. But then if another extinction event happens and, and opens up a whole bunch of places for things to be, then they, be, they get filled quickly and then it becomes more stable afterwards. Yeah, you have a, in the, in the uh, aftermath of mass extinction events, you've got this hiatus period where you've got this impoverished fossil record. You know, you, yeah. you look in, in you know, you, you look in the sedimentary strata and you'll see a lot of fossils, particularly like go back to the Ordovician, a lot of fossils right there up to that boundary. And then it's almost vacant of fossils for a long period of time. And then all of a sudden, boom, there's a lot of fossils again. Right. Yeah, like the Cambrian the, explosion, they talk about that. But, right? but yes. those, are the, yeah. those are the actual catastrophic events that, that give you all those fossils, and then it's followed by not much, right? By not much, yeah. So, so you, could, there, you could make the argument that all of these species existed all the way back. So we had all of the species, and then each uh, catastrophic event wiped out what's in the fossil record. Yeah, and then the next well, one wiped out what's in the fossil record. Yeah, yeah it, it, exactly. And and see, here's the thing: under normal circumstances, uh, creatures that die don't form fossils. Yeah, yeah. You see, yeah. they even even modern day okay. elephant mortality. You know, I've got some interesting studies we can pull up here as we're talking about this, and I do intend to pull them up. You know, in the '80s when these droughts were so severe in sub-Saharan Africa, you had several million elephants that that died off right, during those droughts and left their remains around water holes that had dried up, right? So you had, and then in, in addition to that, the 80s saw this rise of, of, um, of, of poaching that where they were killing elephants and just taking the tusks and leaving the carcasses on the landscape. Well, we defined the term taphonomy, right? Remember the term taphonomy, which means uh, the, the processes um, that lead from the initial death of an individual, the, the, the carcass of an individual, and its final preservation as a fossil by whatever route that takes and whatever uh, the, the end product of that is where it's, it's preserved somehow. But what, what was discovered in the taphonomic studies of elephant mortality in the 80s was that elephants would die. You could come out and there would be, you know, remains of dozens of elephants and five years later, you don't find anything. Five years. So, again, how do you preserve an elephant carcass? Well, you you got to bury it. You got to get it away from oxygen. You got to get away from scavengers. Yep. So, strip away yeah. all of the plant matter, all of the topsoil, get down to some bedrock, put the body there, cover it in gravel. Cover it in sand and gravel. <laughs> oh, yeah. Mud. That mud needs to be. Or in mud. Like yeah, mud. Thank you. Anaerobic. <clears throat> Yes, mud or, thanks. Mud or clay, anaerobic environment. Anaerobic, yes, meaning without oxygen. And then cover the gravel with mud. <laughs> there you go. 
<laughs> well, you know, the, for example, that we talked about the or, uh, Oralton Farms Mastodon was found under a layer of peat um, that, you know, most likely was, <clears throat> was uh, wet, soggy stuff that was deposited over the mammoth, the Mastodon shortly after his death or immediately after his death and, and helped to seal it off. Um, and there's to, like all the, the bog body, right? Those mummified human. Yeah. And, and that's an, a good example of anaerobic preservation. Yeah. Heat bogs. Yeah. Heat bogs, yes. So I was thinking um, in the scenario where the sulfur dioxide, was it, that was exploding into the, into the atmosphere and it was raining down at a pH of one, what was it that was... I mean, I was just thinking about... Well, yeah, that was the acid rain from... Yeah, yeah. This is... Yeah, this is going back to the KT. KT. Yeah. So that basically created probably a, an anaerobic environment everywhere. Yeah, right? and, and, and in the oceans. Anoxia, it's referred to in the oceans when there's this cessation of when oxygen doesn't become available. And then what you have is you have huge deposits. In fact, they're, they're, they're like off the coast of the... Off the mouth of the Nile... They've documented uh, successive layers of sapropolitic muds or sapropels, which basically are, um, you know, incompletely decomposed organic material that has been flushed into the Mediterranean by huge floods coming down the Nile River. And because they're buried so rapidly, they're cut off from oxygen, so they don't fully decompose. So when they pull up these dredge samples or these core samples, it stinks. Yeah. When it's exposed to air. So that would be something interesting to talk about is these Nile floods. And, and at some point, if we come back to talk about the Sphinx and the erosion on the Sphinx, we'll, we'll tie it in and, and look at the fact that there have been these extraordinary Nile floods that could have submerged the Sphinx. A jelly-like ooze or sludge composed of plant remains, most often algae putrefying in an anaerobic environment Oof. on the shallow bottoms of lakes and seas. Yeah, there you go. What was that, Sapropel? Yes. Yeah. It may be a source material for petroleum and natural gas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Re read that once more time. That terms to define since I got this book, so I just had to butt in and do that real quick. <laughs> I'm glad. Well, I'm glad you did. Uh, I want, in fact, I'm so glad you did. I want you to do it one more time so I can hear it. Read, read it oh, I just closed the book. Lost it. <laughs> I get it. That <laughs> propel. It was. Um, yeah, that was good. So basically, m my definition was correct. It just yes. wasn't quite as succinct. Yeah, a jelly like ooze or sludge composed of plant remains, most often algae, putrefying in an anaerobic environment there on the go. shallow bottoms of lakes and seas. Great terminology there sludge, yeah. putrefying. Yeah. Yeah. Rot they didn't use the term rotten, I think I might have, but yeah, so that's I have pulled up some sapropel from the I bottom of a lake before and look, you will know if you've pulled up sapropolitic muds. <laughs> you definitely will know. In fact, I've I've next time my buddies were in the lake swimming around and somebody put oh put that sapropel uh, sapropolitic. <laughs> sapropolitic yeah. <laughs> Dispose of that sapropolitic mud. <laughs> this I don't think I don't think they use the word sapropolitic mud. <laughs> Wait a minute. They what? didn't do what, Mike? I don't think they would have used the term saprolytic mud. I think oh. it would have been a shorter four letter word. Four letter Ky word Kyle's exactly. buddies, you mean? Oh, okay. I thought you meant the, 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 no, the, the marine dog. geologists that were. <laughs> yeah. It's so they did actually use the term like... saprolytic mud. But yeah, and you know that if you're out in, in you know, I, which I've done many times, been in lakes, my bare feet, you know, and you can feel your yeah. foot sinking into that stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Don't bring it up. All <laughs> right. So sorry about that digression, folks, but I think it may help you to remember now. So in the future, when we're talking about sapropels, you'll know what we're talking about yeah. because sapropels are important diagnostic materials. Why? Because when you have a great flood coming off the land, it's filled with organic material, whether it flows into the, into the ocean or into a lake, what happens is, is the rapid deposition of that material at the bottom of, of uh, say, offshore, I, I made reference to the sapropolitic muds off the coast of uh, Egypt, where Nile floods had flushed them out, but you can find examples of 
sap propels all over the place. And basically they would be indications of major floods. The thicker the sap propel layer, the greater the flood. Okay. So this is the importance of these stinky putrefying mud deposits. And because of the, the fact that they're rapidly cut off from oxygen in an anoxic environment um, is why they don't decompose. So yes. That's fascinating. So the other, one other thing I wanted to, going back to the extinction events, yeah. it seems to me like the more powerful, the catastrophic event that causes the extinction, the farther down the food chain the extinction takes place. Is that generally correct? I think that, yes, I think generally that's correct. Right, because the farther up the food chain you get, the fewer, the larger and the fewer the animals are in general. Yes. So like the, the, the extinction always starts at the top of the pyramid there, and the stronger the extinction event, the farther down the pyramid the extinction level goes. In general. Yeah, yeah. in general, yeah. For example, in the, in the aftermath of an extinction level event, you're going to probably have rats surviving a lot more prolifically than mastodons exactly yes well there, yes. Are, gonna be, there are gonna be more rats there's I more mean, rats right. they can hide in more places and they need less food and resources yeah exactly yeah and they reproduce very fast yeah. and as you go up the food chain you know that all of those parameters are changing until you get to the top of the food chain and now you're looking at you know long periods of intergenerational turnover large mm -hmm. larger areas of habitable land to provide the food source. So I think that goes a long way towards explaining the terminal Pleistocene extinctions. So anyways, back to the, uh, to what we've been talking about here in terms of the evidence for um, an ET event. Uh, a great study came out in 2009. Uh, the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences has actually been pretty fair minded in their presentation of these controversial ideas. They presented um, both the pro and the con side uh, in terms of what happened and whether it did in fact involve an ET event. But um, yeah, we were talking about the hexagonal diamonds uh, last week as being one of the diagnostic materials. So uh, this was a study that was published in 2009. Uh, Douglas J. Kennett in, in the the same group basically who've been doing this work and they uh, published a paper called shock synthesized hexagonal diamonds in younger dryest boundary sediments. Um, and we found that, that the hexagonal uh, diamonds are called Lonsdalite after Kathleen Lonsdale, who was a mineralogist who did some of the very first work on discovering hexagonal diamonds. Uh, it says the diamonds occur in a discrete layer that is contemporary with and similar to the organic rich sedimentary layers described by Haynes across North America. And there we are talking about the black mat layer. And I think the relevance to the discussion we just had is that the black mat layer can almost be thought of as a sapropolitic layer. To some, but due to the fact that it tends to be narrower in width, um, it, it, it does, it, its properties are going to be somewhat different because you're going to have more, if you have a, a three foot thick or a six foot layer of saprolytic muds, you know, the, the outer layers are going to, um, have, uh, interaction with whatever is above or below, right? Just, and so would in a layer three inches thick or two inches thick, which is very typical for the black mat layer. Um, but so it says the best known geological exposure of this dark sedimentary unit is 1.35 kilometers from the modern coastline on the west side of the canyon. And this is back to this Santa Rosa Island that we, where we left off with where there's a 44 centimeter thick organic rich dark blue gray silty black layer of mud which rests directly on a gravel deposit at five meters depth. The rest of the overlying sequence consists of alluvial sands and gravel. Um, now, alluvial, again, means flowing water, or, or it means deposited by, by water, right? Fluvial means flowing water. Pluvial means rainfall. Mm. Fluvial, fluvial, and alluvial. <laughs> Got it. Got it? 
plu, pluvial, fluvial, and alluvial. Okay. There's so a song, there's a song in there somewhere. I think there is. <laughs> Accelerator mass spectrometry, AMS, carbon-14 dates from upper and lower parts of the sequence are statistically similar, suggesting rapid accumulation of fluvial deposits shortly after 12.9 plus or minus 1,000 years ago. So right there we have um, this layer of diamonds associated with this black layer that's dating to 12.9. Um, these shock synthesized diamonds are also associated with proxies indicating major biomass burning. The, the three proxies are charcoal, carbon spherules, and soot. This biomass burning at the Younger Dryas onset is regional in extent and coeval with broader continent-wide biomass burning. Now, coeval means happening at the same time. Um, it also coincides with abrupt sediment mass wasting and ecological disruption. And the last known occurrence of pygmy mammoths on the Channel Islands, correlating with broader animal extinctions throughout North America. The presence of shock synthesized hexagonal and other nanometer sized diamonds in younger driest boundary sediments in association with soot and other wildfire indicators is consistent with a cosmic impact event at 12.9 plus or minus 0.1 thousand years ago. And the hypothesis that the Earth crossed paths with a swarm of comets or carbonaceous chondrites producing air shocks and or surface impacts that contributed to abrupt ecosystem disruption and megafaunal extinctions in North America. So that's kind of where we left off last time was talking about these Channel Islands, right, which is our, off the coast of, of Southern California. Now, come, come to 2009, and we have a study in Halls Cave, Texas, which you guys were going to go visit, right? Right. right. So what, what do you have to report on your explorations of Halls Cave? We put an offer in. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, um, so yeah, anyways, we talked about Hall's Cave, which is just in your backyards almost, right? right. Yeah. Yeah. We were so, saying where we work, Kerrville. Yeah. We've actually been working in Hondo, which is yeah. the other direction yeah, for an direction. hour and a half. So, but when we get back to Kerrville, Kerrville we're, we're going to Hall's there. Cave. That's right. Okay. Because yeah. it provides a unique opportunity for testing the presence of a chronostratigraphic datum. That's right. Right? Another term. Everybody, I want everybody listening to remember, memorize and remember this term, chronostratigraphic datum. Chrono, right, means time, stratigraphic. So it's a correlation between the strata layers and the succession of time intervals. So the presence of a chronostratigraphic datum, which is the Younger Dryas boundary, and it containing rare and exotic proxies, including nano diamonds, soot, and magnetic spherules, the origins of which remain controversial, but possibly derived from a cosmic impact approximately 12,900 calendar years before present. So this is the study by uh, T.W. Stafford, E. Lundelius, James Kennett, uh, his son, Douglas Kennett, Alan West was on this paper, Wendy Wolbach was on this paper. Um, they describe it as being a karst collapse cave in Cretaceous limestones. Um, and in relevance to what we were talking about earlier, the cave sequence contains an abundant small animal vertebrae fossil record, exhibiting biostratigraphic changes and the timing of the late Pleistocene megafaunal extinction is consistent with that elsewhere in North America. Um, so yes, you've got, uh, you've got sediments at or within 10 centimeters of this contact, 
contained the local extinction of four species of bats, the local extinction of the prairie dog, and perhaps other burrowing mammals in response, and the uppermost occurrence of six late Pleistocene megafaunal taxa that, although rare in the cave, do not extend younger than 12.9 thousand years ago. So here you have a mingling of small species and large species. And it would appear that the prairie dog survived, but in this particular place, as it says, it was a local extinction. Mm. So here you have a commingling of extant species, species that did survive, along with species that didn't survive. Uh, and again, notice that the species that survive are the smaller ones. Prairie dogs are smaller than mammoths, in case you were wondering. And I know, Russ, you were wondering. I saw you. I was wondering that because you, you were, were wondering. Pig, pygmy mammoths a minute ago. I was like, wait, there were little hairy elephants? Um, so one. they took, they, they analyzed the sediments within this cave. And when they did, they found that there was a layer of this red clay, right? They called it a distinct lithologic layer. And they are immediately preceding, immediately preceding the lithologic, litho means rock, right? Lithological contact containing an abundance of nano diamonds, soot, and 2,400 parts per million of magnetic spherules and carbon spherules, all of which we interpret as evidence for a unique chronostratigraphic marker in the Western Hemisphere. Because the age of this horizon is approximately 13,000 calendar years before present, we interpret the age of the event as the beginning of the Younger Dryas cooling. So here in this cave in Texas, they found at this datum, this chronostratigraphic datum, where there was a local extinction of species, right? Um, and and uh, also a, a much wider, so you had this, the local extinction of smaller species, you had the much wider extinction of the megafaunal species. But in this deposit, in this cave that's dating to 13,000 plus or minus, you also had these various proxies, the soot, the magnetic spherules, the carbon spherules, and the nanodiamonds. So this is, uh, you guys have got some uh, work to do there. Definitely got a field trip to, to yeah, do. You do. Believe me. It will happen as soon as we get the chance to do it. Yep. I'm happen. sure. Holidays, well, hope, that, you know. Hopefully, yeah, I mean, I don't know if you have any idea of whether you guys are going to be able to get access to the cave. Well, yeah, that's that's another question. But I, I no, think... We'll get in. But yeah. We'll get yeah. in. <laughs> you may have to employ your ninja skills. That's right. <laughs> I'll have to dust those off. <laughs> Either that or just brute force. <laughs> yeah. Just blast your way in. Yeah. Make a new karst window. We'll get in there. Yeah, I, through the karst window. We've got some names on on uh, on the papers that yeah. you know people who are studying in there. Yeah. Uh, so if if anything, we can contact or try to reach out to some of these people or universities or whatever and be like, hey, you know, let's go. Yeah. Yeah. They might be down. Especially if we sing them a song. <laughs> Yeah. Talk to the I Hicks. Talk to the Hicks brothers. Have you ever seen the pluvial deposits <laughs> at the YDB? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I think you got a hit on your hands there, it's Kyle. That'll work. <laughs> <laughs> so, a study from the Murray Murray Springs Clovis site, and the question of extraterrestrial impact. This was a paper. Uh, again, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, C. Vance Haynes was the lead author, published in 2010. So they took a sample from the Murray Springs, which is where you see this um, really well-defined black matte layer um, that I think we showed a picture of a couple of episodes ago. Um, so what they did was they uh, studied magnetic particles found at the base of this layer, and then studied them under, uh, made microscopic examinations with uh, 100 times amplification and 400 times 
uh, magnification. Um, so both reflected and transmitted light revealed what appeared to be sub-angular. I mean, not quite really sharp, but more, you could think of it as more blunt angles, right? Detrital magnetite grains and rock forming silicates with a few silvery microspherules ranging in size from approximately 10 to 70 micrometers. They look like microscopic, highly polished ball bearings. And what I'm gonna do is sh share a screen here so that you can see these uh, magnification of these samples taken from the Murray Springs site. So let me do a screen share here. Here we go. Among the buried samples contains the highest percentage of magnetics separated from the microstrata. Um, so you can see here, I've got an arrow pointing to one of these ball bearings, one of these microscopic ball bearings. Are you seeing it? Oh, I see it. Great. Yes. So this is the kind of stuff that's showing up under the microscope. And this is what's showing up in abundance in the mass extinction. So, and also the same layer that's showing up the, the soot and the, the evidence of biomass burning. These things are found, these tiny microscopic ball bearings. And are those the magnetic ones or? Uh, yes. Okay, the magnetic spirals, okay. Mm -hmm. The Clovis occupation surface at Murray Springs is a sharp stratigraphic contact upon which rests black organic clay which is the black mat. The Murray Springs black mat covers and preserves the Clovis Age landscape. Hundreds of Clovis stone artifacts in direct association with skeletons of two mammoths, 11 bison, and bones of dire wolf and horse were exposed under the black mat by archaeological excavations. Interesting. So, Here's this black mat covering the landscape. And right under here, you see these extinct species. And then when you look at the sedimentary deposits under the microscope, you start seeing these little magnetic ball bearings. We retain the opinion that we have yet to understand what happened approximately 12,900 calendar years ago that abruptly terminated the major elements of Pleistocene megafauna. The ET impact hypothesis has sparked several investigations that are leading to new knowledge. And although our data from Murray Springs and elsewhere do not support it, neither did they preclude it. So what you're having here is Vance Haynes is now, of course, this distinguished paleontologist. So him and his group are taking a very conservative view of this, right? I mean, I, I, I think he may have passed away. I mean, he's, He's looking at this. He's probably in his late 80s in 2010 when this is being written. So he's been looking at this stuff for half a century. And he's the guy, in fact, who first identified this ubiquitous black mat layer over North America and noted the association of this black mat layer with this sharp stratigraphic shift that occurred. And that below it, you had Clovis. Uh, and below it, you had megafauna, extinct megafauna, but not above it. So he's, he's, he's being uh, very conservative here. Um, while we're here, look up, see if you can find the term, uh, Kyle, Rancho Labrean. Rancho Labrean. Well, Rancho Labrean is basically, yeah, you know, the, the Labrean tar pits where a lot of the late Pleistocene mammals. So it's a term that's usually referring to basically the animals that went extinct at the end of the Pleistocene. It's a paleontological term. Um, and that's all that it means. It's just, it's just a, another term for what we're talking about here. Um, so this is Melissa A. Scruggs and a team of one, two, three, four, five others, 2010, investigation of sediment containing evidence of the Younger Dryas Boundary Impact event in El Carrizal, Baja, California. 
Mexico. So the Younger Dryas boundary or YDB, extraterrestrial impact hypothesis posits that one or more, one or more extraterrestrial objects exploded over the Laurentide ice sheet 12,900 plus or minus 100 years ago. This event is purported to have triggered the Younger Dryas stadial and coincides with the Rancho La Brean termination. In other words, the termination of these species of animals that are categorized under the heading Rancho La Brean, but it's just the extinct megafauna that we've been talking about, right? Let's back up. Stadial. Do you remember, remember that? We've discussed stadial. Stades, interstades. Interstades, stades, yeah. interstades glacial, interglacial. Yes, I kind of use the analogy of, you know, glacial, interglacial. Back and forth. Stayed, interstayed. So all climate changes are not of this magnitude. There are climate changes that are of this magnitude. So basically, a stayed would be a more short-lived event, um, probably not as severe. What they're doing is they're calling the Younger Dryas a stayed because it's not, again, a full-blown glacial age, so to speak. Right. right? Um, this event is purported to have triggered the Younger Dryas stale, coincides with the Rancho La Brea termination, which is megafaunal extinction, and the disappearance of the Paleo-Indian Clovis culture. Evidence supporting or refuting this hypothesis has great implications for the fields of geology, paleontology, and archaeology. Ma geochemical markers at the YD of the YD impact, and then it references the Firestone paper of 2007, include magnetic and carbonaceous spheroids. We were just looking at some of the magnetic spheroids. Elevated levels of radioactivity and iridium and nanodiamonds, including Lon's Delight. The event horizon at sites across North America is often overlain by a darker layer. So uh, they went on and took samples. Our field site for testing the YDB ET impact hypothesis is located on the El Carrizal Fault, 38 kilometers south of La Paz, Baja, California, Sur. It gives the coordinates, which maybe I, I should have gone ahead and pulled up a map of this showing exactly where it is, but it's on that area of Baja, California. Um, the site is situated along the uplifted side of a fault within an arroyo, exposing the Pleistocene Holocene transition elements. An arroyo, you remember, is just a gully that's been cut in the desert floor. Many of the arroyos are relatively recent of the last um, couple of centuries, probably associated with the termination of the Little Ice Age from natural factors and also anthropogenic factors because of human occupation, land clearing, and so on that would accelerate erosion that would allow cutting of the gullies into the desert floor. So the presence of in situ, meaning there in the site, right, Rancho La Brea and megafauna fossils at El Carrizal was independently verified by investigators, um, including mammoth, mammoths, mammoths that were found. Uh, so anyways, the section included an anomalous greenish clastic layer. Clastic means just that there are pieces, almost like um, the class are the pieces of rock and mineral that are composing this layer, okay? At approximately 138 plus or minus six centimeters below the road surface, which they, the road surface they used as a datum because there's a road going by there. So preliminary laboratory analysis yielded magnetic spherules under 60 to 70 X magnification and a peak in radioactivity was found at a depth of 136 to 138 centimeters, coinciding with the lower part of the darker green layer. So they found the same magnetic spherules that we were just looking at in the Murray Springs. So what we're doing here is 
each of these, these teams are going out and looking at these various sites, looking at that layer. Then we'll jump down to... Uh, what, what kind of radioactivity are they talking about? Well, this is, this is... I'm not sure because this is the only report of radioactivity that I've seen. All right. We'll have to delve back into that because I, I emphasize that because it raises some interesting questions, doesn't it? It does. It does. Yes, it does. Also, okay. we're, at, we're at the hour mark. Just letting you know. Okay. Uh, 2010, again, William C. Mahaney, who is doing some great work now um, on this, and I think he's joined the Comet Research Team. Uh, evidence for a cosmogenic origin of fired glacial fluvial beds in the northwest western Andes. Um, they're finding, in the abstract, fired sediment, fired sediment, considered equivalent to the black mat impact layer of 12.9 thousand years ago, has been located and analyzed in the Andes of northwestern Venezuela. The black mat refers to possible fallout from a comet airburst presumed to have occurred over the Laurentide ice sheet. The impact spreading ejecta over large portions of North America and Europe, making it an interhemispheric event of considerable magnitude. These possible equivalent beds in the northern Andes, first considered to result from a lightning-induced conflagration adjacent to the retreating late Wisconsin ice, are now known to have undergone intense heating upon impact to a temperature much higher than what would occur in wet first stage successional tundra. In other words, ice is retreating. You've got the first stage tundra left in the wake. The, the old idea was it was struck by lightning and this caused fires. And it was these fires, right, um, that, that was responsible for these beds. Well, now this team is finding evidence that it was way too hot to be a, a typical forest fire, basically. Um, analysis was carried out by scanning electron microscopy, and uh, which shows massive micro disruption on grain surfaces, fractures diminishing with depth toward grain interiors, and carbon welded onto quartz and plagioclase minerals. <laughs> the presence of copious monazite. Now, monazite is an interesting mineral. Uh, it's a phosphate mineral. Uh, it usually occurs small isolated grains um, in igneous and metamorphic rocks, such as granite and schist and gneiss. Um, but what's interesting about monazite is it has a lot of thorium in it, which is radioactive. Yeah. Right. Very radioactive. Um, and in fact, it's been proposed that thorium could be used as a replacement for uranium. Yes. Um, in nuclear power generation, which is an interesting thing that I would like to talk about further because thorium could possibly provide a whole new source of energy that has not been explored by the government, mainly because the radioactive isotopes are not usable for creating bombs. Right. Thorium mm. salts don't let you make bombs. Right. Right. What a, what a bummer. What a bomber. <laughs> uh, so now here's, here, here's where it's interesting. Um, the presence of copious monazite in the carbonaceous coatings is considered part of the incoming ejecta as it is not a common indicator mineral in the local lithology. So in other words, it's been redeposited from somewhere else. The intergrowth of the carbonaceous black mat material with thermally disrupted and fragmented quartz and feldspar and a welded patina of up to 400 nanometer thickness could only occur with temperatures in excess of 900 degrees centigrade. The event interpreted here to be of cosmogenic origin. Wait a minute. The welded patina is meaning that it was 
the patina was made by like extreme heating on the exterior? Yes, exactly. He goes on to say that the reversal of global warming during the Alarod subcron and sudden onset of the Younger Dryas cooling event has been documented by a number of researchers, coinciding with a large scale Clovis age megafaunal extinction. It had far reaching consequences affecting the geoecological environment across North America and Europe. Newly discovered sites in Europe indicate the event was indeed interhemispheric and may have inf- affected the entire world. Wow. Although clearly contentious as to proof for an extraterrestrial origin of the black mat, the one site location in the Northern Andes described herein and getting back to Mike's recent expedition, uh, <laughs> new evidence from Patagonia point tentatively to either an asteroid or comet event that reached far into South America, perhaps even to Antarctica. Oof. Yep. Man. Pretty wild. Wild stuff. So um, I'm going to do another share screen here from showing the energy dispersive spectroscopy spectrum that they did. Um, Let me see here. Okay. Go there. We'll share screen. Here it is. All right. We see it. You see it. Yeah. Um, Plagioclase, probably with cosmic aluminum, right here, a huge spike. Uh. That uh, the high carbon over here on the left is from impact ejecta and ignited terrestrial vegetation. Traces of manganese and iron over here are typical components of the black mat. The origin of the chlorine spike right here is unknown, but might originate from a comet meteorite airburst. So that is the the dispersive spectroscopy, which is basically taking and shooting a highly energetic beam of electrons or protons at the sample. And then looking at, you know, what it does is it basically excites the electrons in the electron shells. And the lowest energy electron shells, which will be closer to the nucleus, will get knocked out of the atom first. But as soon as, because they're lower energy, but because they get knocked out, they, they, they leave a hole in that shell, and atoms don't like having holes in the shell. So another electron from a higher energy cell migrates down to fill that hole. But because it's a higher energy state, right? It has to release energy. It has to release exactly. It, it has down. to release the energy. And so it does, and it releases the energy in the form of an X-ray that contains the, the unique signature of the that, atomic element. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That Basic is, geometry. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. So... Uh, that is really cool. We need to get one of those. Yeah. Yeah, we need to shoot some of those lasers at rocks that we find around here. Yeah. And see what happens. Right. yeah. I'm all for that. That's why uh, we need a laboratory here. So now, let's see if I can find... Uh, I want to talk about some of the critics. Um, and there have been critics. And probably the leader of the critics has been Mark Boslow, who's done some excellent work, actually, some great work. I've read papers from his from years ago, so I don't quite understand his reluctance, although knowing that he has written for the Huffington Post regularly kind of raises a suspicious red flag for me that there is a political element Mike knows what I'm talking about. That's why we have normal guy here. 
<laughs> because only normal guy would read the Huffington Post. Okay, he says, this is arguments and evidence against a younger Dryas impact event, which appeared in Climates, Landscapes, and Civilizations in the year 2012, part of the Geophysical Monograph series. While cubic and hexagonal or Lonsdalite diamond have been found in shock metamorphosed meteorites and are associated with terrestrial impact structures, cubic diamonds are well known to occur in terrestrial rocks that have no association with impact processes. Submicron and smaller sized cubic diamond crystals have been recently demonstrated to exist in carbon spherules within surface soils sampled from various sites in Germany and Belgium. And he quotes Yang et al. 2008, whose work we will come back to momentarily. While the origin of these diamonds remains unclear, they were evidently not produced by impact processes because they are present in modern soil and lack any links to impact structures. Consequently, the value of cubic diamonds as impact markers is highly suspect. Hmm, interesting. Um, he that? says that similar um, diamonds have been found and carbon spherules have been found within surface soils sampled from various sites in Germany and Belgium. So, that doesn't mean that go yeah please please continue it doesn't mean that they didn't come from the same event well yeah just because they're found closer to the surface does not disprove their right. cosmogenic origin yeah, yeah. he because says they were evidently not produced by impact processes and he gives two reasons because they're present in modern soil and they lack any links to impact structures well, should we say they lack links to any known impact structures? That does not then mean that there are no links. It's just that, I mean, who's, who's looked yet? Right. Well, he goes on. He says, magnetic microspheral abundance results published by the impact proponents have not been reproducible by other workers. Analysis of the same younger Dryas site stratigraphy by Suravel et al. 2009 could not replicate observations for two of the impact mar markers published by Firestone and others in 2007. The study by Suravel and others in 2009 found no peaks of abundance unique to the YD time interval. So what he's saying there now, and, and I don't know if you remember this, but having followed this as I have, I remember it when this was published, um, the Suravel study, um, a lot of mainstream media came out with headings such as experts have disproved the yeah. impact hypothesis, right? Done deal. We, we, can, yeah. we can write that off and not think about it anymore because the experts, and that was used very frequently in the title of the various articles purporting to, to you know, uh, report upon this study by Suravel, which, which you see here um, Boslow is referencing. He's also bo uh, referencing the work of Yang and others. So I think that we should look. Now, I, what I did was I went ahead and – um, looked at the, um, and read the paper by Yang and others. Um, and here's what I concluded. Boslow and co-authors affirm the well-established view that Lonsdalite diamonds are found in meteorites 
and are associated with impact structures. They make the statement that hexagonal nanodiamonds are also known to be found in terrestrial rocks that have, quote, unquote, no association with impact processes. However, that statement should be qualified by saying no currently known association with impact processes. It should be noted that they offer no alternative explanation as to the origin of such diamonds in terrestrial rock. By way of example, they point out that submicron and even smaller cubic diamond crystals have been found within carbon spherules existing in surface soils in Germany and Belgium. Whereupon they reference the work of Yang and others from 2008. The paper by Yang and others was entitled Transmission TEM or Transmission Electron Microscopy and Raman Characterization, which is just another technical means of identifying materials. TEM and Raman Characterization of Diamond Micro and Nanostructures in Carbon Spherules from Upper Soils. In the opening paragraph, paragraph, the authors of this paper point out this, and I quote, the occurrence of high pressure, high temperature polymorphs, such as diamond or fullerene-like forms of carbon, may be indicative of car impact events. Interesting. So right at the very outset, perhaps significantly, the authors state that in addition to Germany and Belgium, Similar nanodiamond containing carbon spherules, quoting again, have been obtained from selected samples from other areas. After discussion of the elaborate analytical procedure performed on the spherules and their contents using transmission electron microscopy and Raman spectroscopy, this is what they remark. And I quote here, the conclusion for the nanograins thus remains somewhat ambiguous. To our knowledge, these types of spherules have not been described in the literature before, and here's the key, are not known from anthropogenic or biogenic sources. To which I would then ask the question, well, if not from human activity or from terrestrial biological processes, from whence did they originate? Yang and team then remark, and I quote again, the present occurrence is independent from local geology and possibly points to a regional high energy process which would be necessary for the formation of the observed diamond particles. I then ask, so what kind of intermediate or high energy process do the authors have in mind? Well, it just so happens that, and I quote again, the first findings of the spherules was made in the context of small scale crater, crater like structures in the landscape and including severely deformed rocks with some spherules being embedded in the fused crust of excavated rocks. In this respect, an impact-related origin of the spherules with a local or cosmic carbon source cannot be ruled out. Yet we just saw that Boslo is citing this paper as evidence against the impact hypothesis. Let that sink in. Yeah, claiming that they didn't, there was no, no impact association, right? And then they're actually collecting the samples from craters. <laughs> well, they said small, yeah, um, they say small scale, small scale, yeah. crater-like structures in the landscape, which includes severely deformed rocks. That's and true. some of the spherules are embedded in a fused crust. In other words, a fused crust, the, the, the crust of these rocks had to melt, and then the spherules are embedded in that. Yeah. Vitrified crusts on the outsides of the rocks with the spirals in there. Yeah. So, again, quoting, such a structure, and this is from the Yang paper, such a structure suggests a rapid and high temperature event in which the original material has melted and evaporated. So then I say, perhaps they are being overly prudent 
when they state that an impact re related origin cannot be ruled out. Yeah. Yet, precisely the fact, despite the fact that Yang and his co workers declare that an impact origin for these spherules cannot be ruled out and clearly imply that it is a possibility, Boslo and his cohorts do precisely that. And in their conclusion regarding the origin of these spherules, Yang and his co-authors state, and I quote, it is suggested that they may have been formed during a high pressure, high temperature event, possibly related to an exogenic phenomena not yet known. So they leave it, uh, yeah, pretty interesting. But I asked the question, so how do these results negate the findings of Kenneth's team as the Boslow team implies? Right. The fact that the spherules were found in more recent sediments, Boslow and others try to use to discredit the work of the Kenneth team. But consider this carefully now. The fact that the Yang team found spherules containing nanodiamonds in more recent sediments than the Younger Dryas boundary means, according to Boslow and others, that they were evidently not produced by impact processes because they are present, present in modern soil and lack any links to impact structures. Again, I ask, how is this conclusion supported by the findings of Yang and others when they actually invoke impact as a possible explanation? But what are possible impact-produced spherules doing in recent soils? I would suggest that the findings in Germany and Belgium support the idea that cosmic impacts may be more frequent than gradualist dogma will acknowledge. And the fact that an impact of some type of cosmic object over Europe in times more recent than 12,900 years ago in no way negates the possibility of something similar happening on a larger scale at 12,900 years ago. All right, I have a question here. Uh-oh. You know, as to the deposition of, of spherules and nanodiamonds, um, when you've got something like an airburst like tongue, like... Uh, Anguska. Well, not only Tunguska, but the w recent one in, in Russia. Chelyabinsk. Chelyabinsk. Do those create those kinds of uh, detritus? Yes. Do they, and do they and, scatter? Yes. And we are going to examine particularly Tunguska in great detail because that is a really important cosmic lesson. And the information that we extract from the studies of Tunguska really can lend insight into ancient events, because this is something that happened, you know, just a little over a century ago, what, 112 years ago now, next summer. Um, yeah, and, and yeah, there's extraordinary lessons that have, have been gleaned from the studies of the Tunguska event. Well, and yes, and, microspherals, that's one of them. Nanodiamonds, oh, no. Right. Microspherals, yes. Possible iridium layer, yes, possible iridium layer. Um, I mean, you're, you're basically atomizing whatever is in those those meteorites. Um, yes. So that would be my guess. I mean, you're you're basically creating, taking a a, a fairly large body and vaporizing it and creating micro meteorites scattering all over the place. Is that correct? I'm sorry, my my mind wandered for a second. <laughs> yeah, it's like little tectites you're talking about. But yeah, right? when when you yeah. when you have an airburst like that, you you're taking a larger body, yes. shattering it, vaporizing good parts of it, but then scattering essentially micrometeorites everywhere else. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. And and the microspherules are are crystallized right out of the vapor. Yeah. Yeah. See. So now you can have uh, you know, macro scale tectites. Sure. That you can hold in your hand. Um, yeah, they can yeah. be spherical. Um, I mean, we, we saw we saw a video of, of, uh, of people hunting those down after Chelya bits. They were running all over the place, digging in the snow, looking for meteorite fragments. Yeah. Well, I have a question too about this: the argument that 
microspherules or nano diamonds in modern sediments suggest that they don't have a cosmogenic origin. We have modern sediments that were torn away from cliff sides next to the river mm -hmm. that are extremely ancient. Yeah. And then deposited today, right. yesterday, down the river. Well, in, in my notes that I was writing on this, I, I state this, now I'm, I'm, I'm quoting myself. There is no reason to reject a priori that such spherules could have undergone redeposition from older to younger soil layers in the course of time, especially given the extreme amount of geomorphic landscape modification that has ensued since the terminal Pleistocene. Yeah. There you go. There we go. That's exactly what you were thinking, wasn't it? Exactly. Those, those precisely those same words. In yeah, I thought I just, I yeah. thought those exact words and then it came out different. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why I thought I'd jump in and, and try to help you out there. Cause I saw you struggling. <laughs> so like rock made sense. <laughs> Oh, this is, this is such interesting stuff. I can't get enough of it. Well, no, no, how, long are, how long have we been in here so far? My, my intention is that we would devote a couple more episodes to the Younger Dryas, particularly yeah. addressing some more of the – because now, uh, Boslo, you noticed he, he, he cited two papers, the paper by Yang et al. and Suravel et al. So yeah. we just looked at the Yang paper. So I think what we'll do is next episode, we'll dive into the Suravel paper, and which leads us to uh, a really cool paper by Malcolm, who is uh, the lead author uh, of a very important paper. Uh, lead author was Malcolm LeCompte, who Malcolm was the scientist that we got on if you listen to the Joe Rogan debate mm -hmm. with, um, uh, with, with Michael Shermer, yep. we had um, um, Mark DeFant, the volcanologist, who I think got blindsided a little bit. I'm sure the man yeah. has extraordinary knowledge of volcanism. I'd love to talk to him about volcanism because I imagine he's an authority. Um, and probably knows a lot. And since I'm very interested in volcanoes and the role of volcanoes in earth history and in, in, in cultural history, he might be a good man to talk to actually. Yeah. But the guy we brought on was Malcolm LeCompte, right? Who was uh, the lead author of a paper that we will dive into um, probably in the next episode uh, because it, it's largely a response to the Suravel paper, which was, uh, widely cited as this under the presumption that it was the paper that debunked the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis. And because it was so widely cited uh, and that team was considered the experts that debunked it so that we could basically forget about it and move on to other things more important like global warming or whatever it might be. Um, that's why we should really look into the Suravel paper. But what, um, what the LeCompte team did, and I'm going to... What's the, name of the, the first paper that we just went through that Balzo cited? That was the... What was the guy's name on that one? Sorry. No problem. Yeah, no problem. That was... Um, Yang. Yang et al. Yang. Yang. Y-A-N-G. Yes. Yang. Uh, I can give you the full reference here in a second it's uh who well, i gave you the title i don't have the volume that's all right i'm just right in front of me but i can certainly get you that yeah i um well in fact got it yeah, probably no probably yeah, have it i sure i got my notes straight here Boslo yeah. Yang, Yang. it was uh 2008 in the journal diamond and related materials volume 17 page pages 937 through 943 diamond and related materials. And I'm sure everybody listening is probably regular readers of the journal diamond and related materials. So they're going to all know about this paper. No doubt. <laughs> it's a great journal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's uh... 
Well, that's where this paper appeared. So it's a very specialist, you know, journal aimed at a very limited target audience. Yeah. I listen to their podcast. Yeah. It's a good podcast. Great. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So interesting studies uh, in Mexico that we should look at. There's a whole team down in Mexico led by uh, Isabel Alcantara, if I'm saying her name properly. Um, and looking at the Younger Dryas boundary in Mexico, particularly uh, around the area of, they took uh, core samples from the bottom of Lake uh, Quizio in central Mexico and found a black carbon rich lacustrine layer. Um, and you remember the word lacustrine, right? I do. Means no. lakes. So they took core samples from the bottom of this Lake Quizio. Quiz um, and then what did they discover? nanodiamonds, microspherals, Carbon. and other things that date to the early Younger Dryas. Wow. And that team interpreted these materials as resulting from an extraterrestrial impact. Now, extraterrestrial impact could be related to solar activity. How? We'll, we'll get into that. We've, we've, we've made some references to that. Um, but yeah, I think what we're trying to do here is we're trying to concoct a model that actually involves a whole interrelated series of terrestrial solar events, even galactic events, because we may have to go to the galactic level really to begin to, to understand the flux of cometary objects to the inner solar system. Right. Hmm. So any comments you guys want to make? I think we're probably at our uh, good time to take, take a, a, our break and then pick it up next week. Yeah. Like do they, um, would the composition of the torrid objects help us find out if they were, I mean, like would, be able, would we be? Yes. Able to yes. And we are going to learn about the torrid objects. All right. In great detail. Excellent. So I hope I hope people stay with us and and really follow this through because as 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 has been said, God is in the details, or devil is in the devil. details. Take your pick. Take your pick. Right. Right. In this case, it may be the devil. I think it was Mies van der Rohe, the the architect, that said God is in the details, in reference specifically to architecture. But of course, he was paraphrasing the old saying: the devil is in the details. Right. And John Paul Sartre said, hell is other people. So, What did he say? John Paul Sartre said, hell is other people. Hell is other people. Other people in our hell. Yep. Yeah. Got <laughs> okay. I think I can think of a few examples there. <laughs> I will mention no names at this time, no. So-and-so at all. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I have a I have a brief I mean it's it's not much of a hypothesis but the idea is it seems like like Robert Schock's idea that this was a solar you know that this all of these proxies could have been created by you know a, a natural sort of solar process or something that happened with the sun CME what have you mm -hmm. so you have this big like this rogue body come into the inner solar system the sun causes it to break up large massive pieces of it fall into the sun mm -hmm. right or maybe you know that that would be the fourteen thousand year old thing is we have the cma no One, pulse. yeah meltwater pulse zero oh, okay. or whatever mm -hmm. then the next one is an actual impact which is the beginning of the younger dryas but it's the same body still in orbit that, you know, and maybe there's this thousand year period of after that, everything's in flux. Yeah. How big yeah. would something, how, then, how big would something have to be to trigger a disturbance on the surface of the sun? Well, well surprisingly it, it, not that big. Yeah. yeah. I was thinking about Jupiter. Like I just read a story. I wish I could remember where it was from, but it was about the um, Shoemaker Levy nine impacts they're still studying the disturbance in the atmosphere mm -hmm. really from shoemaker to levy nine which was what 1994 or something Man. Uh, yeah they, they've been watching 
So when they, when it first happened, they're studying the these you know black circular masses where the impacts took place, and then they watched those gases go into the swirls, and it taught us all this stuff about the jet streams and everything going around Jupiter, because they're fo- they're still following the heat those those disturbances time, yeah. that are moving around the atmosphere of Jupiter. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know. That's just crazy. So, yeah, I mean, it could have been, it could have still been one single body, in other words, coming in, being broken up, up. pieces of it go into the sun. Later, some of it hits us. Later, more of it goes into the sun. Yeah. Mm hmm. I don't know. Well, uh, Louise K. Heron, who is a scientist who, solar scientist who studies um, the sun wrote back in 2002, a paper that was published in the philosophical transactions of the Royal society of London. Uh, It was entitled explosive events on the sun. We are now in the unprecedented position of having access to a number of space observatories dedicated to the sun. The Yoka, if I'm saying that right, spacecraft, SOHO, or the Solar Heliospheric Observatory, the Transition Region and Coronal Explorer, and the Ramat High Energy Solar Spectroscopic Imager. So these are all satellite technologies that have been deployed that have been looking at the sun for the last couple of decades. These cover a wide wavelength range from white light to gamma rays with both spectroscopy and imaging and allow huge progress to be made in understanding the processes involved in such large explosions. The high resolution data show dramatic and complex explosions of material on all spatial scales on the sun. They have revealed that the sun is constantly changing everywhere on its surface, something that was never imagined before. There are two types of explosive events on the sun, solar flares and coronal mass ejections. Impulsive energy release in solar flares is one of the most dynamic and highly energetic phenomena in the solar system. The process is poorly understood and yet occurs in a variety of contexts in the universe. For example, solar flares, planetary magnetospheres, active galactic nuclei. Understanding impulsive energy release is a major goal across a wide range of space physics and astrophysics. Coronal mass ejections, on the other hand, pour 10 to the 13th power kilograms of material into the solar system in one event. Um, Much has been learned over the past 10 years about the working of explosive events and their origin. The ultimate goal now is to understand the actual trigger of these spectacular events. So that's it right there, the trigger. What is the trigger? Trigger. It's the 10 to the 13th power kilograms kilograms of stuff first being picked up into a loop by a magnet and then given escape yeah. velocity. And that 10 to the 13th kilograms would be 10 to the 10th metric tons. If you want to do a quick. That's just mind blowing. Wow. That is a lot. That's a lot of stuff. That's a lot of stuff. Yeah. Escape velocity from the sun. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I can't, I don't know that number off the top of my head. Yeah, I'm trying to remember what the, what, what are the estimated, what's the estimated surface gravity, but it's, on oh, the sun, I can't remember. But see, then that gets us to where I think the connection could possibly lie. This was a paper published in 2009 in, uh, at, at the Proceedings of the International Astronomical Union Symposium number 50, 257 under the heading Universal Heliophysical Processes. This paper was... Uh, this particular paper was called Explosion of Sun Grazing Comets in the Solar Atmosphere and Solar Flares. Mm-hmm. And so what this research is doing is showing the correlation of comets being 
sucked into the sun at extraordinarily high velocities and triggering massive explosions and solar flares and coronal mass ejections. So that's where I think we will pick up. We'll come back to that at some point because it's really important. And I think it begins to unify some of the the various models. For example, it it resolves, I think, the the controversy between uh, impact events and solar flares affecting the Earth during these uh, transitional events 12 to 14,000 years ago, roughly. So we won't get into that tonight, but we'll just leave that as a, as a teaser for a future episode that will be coming up. Sounds great. Can't wait for those. Yeah. Fantastic. Excellent. <laughs> Heavy duty. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Very- everyone, everyone can get a hold of us. Cosmographia1618 <laughs> at gmail.com. Uh, go to Cosmographia.com to find the uh, to how to donate. You can go to the Patreon, which is patreon.com forward slash Randall Carlson. Uh, thanks to all the Patreon supporters there. And there is also now a single like one-time donation button that's there right underneath the Patreon link on Cosmographia.com where you can, if you just want to donate once and get it over with, give Randall thousands of dollars just one time. Just one uh, time. Yeah, just Or one, more. Just once. <laughs> then there is a PayPal donate button there that allows you to use credit card, debit card, whatever you want. So, or your PayPal account. Uh, Well, any donations that come into this are going to be used exclusively for moving forward with what we're trying to do here on all levels. You know, with my business, that pretty much pays my bills. Doesn't give me a whole lot to work with beyond that, but any, any donations that come in, any Patreon support that comes in, um, is pretty much going to be dedicated to exclusively, you know, pushing forward the research, more field research, even, um, yeah. More field research, maybe some better equipment. Better equipment, absolutely. Absolutely, because I think this is this, this discussion needs to be happening. Yes. And, uh, you know, it's interesting, especially in the light of current events, what's going down, um, which probably at some point we should, we should talk about. Um, yeah, we got to get the podcast current before we yeah, really discuss we can't. current events. <laughs> they won't be current events by the time this is released. Well, yeah, because by the time, I mean, by the time this gets posted several weeks from now, who knows where where we're going to be right we got to wait till we're caught up before we can go go current event talking <laughs> okay got it <laughs> it's true all right anything else what do i forget thanks to everybody who's supporting us already we really appreciate it uh don't forget geocosmic rex you're probably watching that this on there uh if not check it out also the cosmographia youtube channel and cosmographia.com uh we are brothers of the serpent and we wish you all guys a good night or good morning, wherever you are. <laughs> See you next awesome. week. Yep. Thanks everybody. Bye. End of show. This is Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson podcast. 